All right, welcome back. Uh, so we're on to deontology. I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn you, this is gonna be on the longer side, this lecture, and I may, it's hard to divide it up into uh, two lectures. So I may post one long lecture for this week and, and that will um, be the only lecture you have to uh, watch. It covers nine and 10 of the, uh, of the so, um, we covered, as I said, utilitarianism is one of the big, still very popular views in ethics to this day. It captures about half of how our brains work when we think about morality, right? We do care about consequences. We do want to cause happiness for people, right? We think that's importantly tied to morality and prevents suffering in people. But if we, as we've seen, utilitarianism this is some important things uh notions of justice right notion of right um we do think that there are certain things certain moral rules that you just cannot break no matter what no matter how good the consequences are right so um no one is going to say yeah it's okay to kill my mom to save five people a thousand people right how many people do you stack up there's certain lines that we sometimes feel we just don't or you know i said even if you know, it cause if there's something right, some uh, some way that uh, a bunch of people could get pleasure out of, you know, spying on me and I would never and I just never found out about it. We still say, no, there's I have a certain right to privacy that can't be violated um, no matter how much pleasure it might cause to other people to violate my right. Um, deontology captures that part of morality. The part that says, look, there are certain unbreakable rules, right? There are certain lines you can never cross. But we're going to get into that and un unpack that. And of course, there will be problems with that as well. And that's why um, we're trying to sort this out to this day. Um, and the right answer is probably going to have to um, hopefully not sit well with some part of our brains, right? Our sort of reaction to be almost diametrically imposed, opposed. They both seem right and both seem wrong in deep ways. Uh, so the right answer is, unless they can be totally unified, utilitarianism and deontology, um, there's gonna have to be some sort of compromise and some of our intuitions we're gonna have to I right, to have a unified theory of ethics. But let's get into exactly what deontology is. Sort of a long word, it's got a Greek root, deon, it sort of basically means rule based, as opposed to Remember, utilitarianism, no rules whatsoever, um, action by action, right? We decide what to do based on the adding up the consequences. Deontology, much more rule based. So to sort of illustrate the this impulse, right? Um, uh, Rachel's talks about Elizabeth Anscombe, famous uh, philosopher, uh, Oxford, um, during the time of World War II. So the World War II, there were um, new opportunities for female philosophers uh, because many of the men were off at war. And so there were some, you know, job openings and, and they uh, hired women and Elizabeth Anscombe was one of those female philosophers that sort of uh, hired because <clears throat> during the war and, and ended up being one of the, you know, great philosophers of our time. So, Rachel's describes an incident in her life that's um, not directly about her philosophy, but about her uh, reaction to sort of certain political um, events. Um, so Harry Truman uh, was a U.S. president. Before he was a U.S. president, um, he was, uh, well, involved in World War II, but he um, took over after Roosevelt left off. So FDR was... Uh, president for four terms, right? He's the only president we've had for more than two terms. It was after Franklin Delano Roosevelt left office that we made the rule that you can only uh, stay president for two terms. Um, but so Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the president during World War II and then Harry Truman took over for him, right? So this is sort of the end of World War II. And so um, the allies, which was the US and, and Britain and, uh, and uh, Russia at the time, were all fighting against uh, Germany and, and Italy. And uh, we were well on our way to winning, right? The war in Europe was pretty much over. Um, Japan was the other enemy that we were still at war with. And uh, 
that front in the, in the war was going very slowly and it was very costly in terms of lives. Island there were a lot all of these islands in the South Pacific that uh, the Japanese had taken and we had to take back one by one and um, fighting was brutal. Right? And we still had to uh, eventually try to take over, right, go uh, fight in mainland Japan. And um, the Japanese sort of ethic of, of, of war was that they just do not surrender. They fought off and over. To fight, right, the, the Japanese, it was difficult to, they, again, they didn't want to surrender, so we just had to fight and fight and fight and lose lives, right? So it was going to be very costly. But meanwhile, we had the atomic bomb, right? We had invented the atomic bomb, we had tested it, and the idea was if we dropped the bomb on Japan, it would be so spectacular, right? You could destroy an entire city with one bomb. Um, that the Japanese would be so shocked that they would, in fact, um, and if the Japanese surrendered earlier than later, we could save a lot of lives. The war short, short by a year or two years, many lives would be saved, right? So again, it's sort of utilitarian calculation. Obviously, dropping a bomb would kill a lot of people and a lot of civilians, right? Um, a lot of children, right? people's homes would be destroyed, hospitals would be destroyed, lots of innocent people would die. But adding up the lives, right? the calculation was, well, fewer people will die if we just blast a bunch of people in a single spectacular bomb than if we fought out for years and years. Right? And so in the end, Truman made that utilitarian calculation, decided to drop the atomic bomb, and um, he thought, you know, adding it up, it's the best course from a sort of utilitarian perspective. And it did win the war. So uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, you know, at that point was a very, again, she was a famous philosopher at, at this point. Uh, she was also a pacifist and a devout Catholic. And later after the war in the, in the 1950s, the university at Oxford wanted to give Harry Truman an honorary degree right, which is something that universities will do for sort of famous people, right, say, okay, you've got an honorary PhD in whatever, right, even though you didn't. Um, so she was opposed to this, on, conferring this honorary degree on Truman. She wrote out a pamphlet explaining her objections, and she called Truman a murderer. It was, she objected to the fact that Truman dropped the atomic bomb, right, on civilians and people in Japan. That, quote, for men to choose the Men to choose to kill the innocent as a means to their ends is always murder. Right? Um, and of course, you know, where the utilitarian argument, right, in favor of dropping the bomb, saying, look, sure, it kills some innocent civilians, but think, you know, on the whole, how many lives it saved by cutting the war short. And her response to that argument was, again, quote, you had to choose between boiling one baby and letting some frightful disaster befall a thousand people or a million people if a thousand is not enough what would you do well ask yourself that question what would you do would right someone hand you a baby over a pot of boiling water and says you can save a thousand lives if you drop this baby in the in the pot would you do it right and Thanscombe is thinking no you wouldn't right you just never do right? you know and she, she thinks even if the number you can save a million lives by boiling that baby, right? Uh, she thinks that our instincts would say no. I just can't ever do that. There are some things that may not be done, no matter what. So that sort of ethical approach, right? There, where there are some rules that are just unbreakable, um, we call that a deontological approach, right? A rule-based approach. Um, is there an argument for that? Certainly, again, it sort of makes sense in your gut a little bit. You, many of you probably did think, yeah, I guess I couldn't boil a baby, right, to save a bunch of lives. Right? But, and while our, you know, our intuitions do count as data when we're uh, studying ethics, we also would like to have an argument for any ethical theory. So, where does where is the argument for rule-based ethics, right? Well, one way you could do it. Right, would be to be a, a religious approach, right? The Ten Commandments are a set of rules, right, that are meant to guide morality. And those are supposed to be grounded in God's commands, right? But of course, we've seen some of the difficulties earlier in the course with a divine command theory of ethics, right? Um, 
So is there a way to get a rule-based ethics that, that is justified in, in another way? Right? And um, Kant, famous German philosopher, does offer us such a theory. Right? It's a deontological ethical theory, right? so it's rule-based, but it's not based in the authority of, of God or anything like that. It's based entirely on reason. Right? Um, in the, end, in the end, he will have unbreakable rules. He will say, for example, that lying is wrong no matter what the consequences, right? It's even wrong if it saves a life, right? Lying is just always wrong. Um, to say that the truth of those rules is grounded in the nature of human right. Um, so let's look at his argument for this claim. Now, Kant is a notoriously difficult reading, right? So he's a German philosopher from the 1500s. Um, we have, you know, Various good translations, but even in the best translations, he's he's a difficult difficult read. But also, you know, people still study him because there's and the more and more I read him and teach him, I find there's something very deeply right in what he says. How the arguments fit together. So he's someone that's always worth studying and digging into more. So. Um, Kant starts with the distinction between what he calls hypothetical imperatives and categorical imperatives. Hypothetical imperative is a kind of normative claim. We've been talking about normative claims throughout this uh, course, right? Normative claims are should or ought claim, right? And, and we've seen that some of them are merely practical, right? So if I want to get to uh, Woodbury University or Cal Lutheran or UC San Diego or any of the places I've taught, right? Um, I can say, oh, you should take the five, or you should take the 118. Oh, you, you really ought to uh, on the uh, the 15, giving it, uh, and, and so on, right? So these are claims about what you should do or ought to do, but not in any deeply moral sense, right? Um, Kant calls them hypothetical imperatives because they only apply if you have a certain goal, right? So if I want this particular result, then I ought to such and such. If I want to get right to Woodbury University quickly, then I ought to take. But if I don't want to get to Woodbury, right, um, then yeah, I, there's no imperative I have to take the five. So these are again only hypothetical. You know, uh, they always have an if clause, right? And and so there's some kind of normativity, right? Some sort of should or ought, but it's always conditional on some particular. Thing. But the other types of normative statements, right? The other types of imperatives he calls oracle imperatives, and those don't have the if part, right? They're not contingent on some particular goal that you might have. These are the moral imperatives, right? So these are imperatives like do not lie, period. Do not steal, period, right? Not saying, you know, if you want people to like you, don't lie, right? If you don't want to go to jail, don't steal. It's there's no if part of it, right? It's not even if you want to be a good person, you X. Moral rules are simple in that way, and they apply to everyone, regardless of your particular goals, right, or desires, right? Um, and that's why, you know, if you steal or murder, we put you in a jail, right, even if you don't care about following the moral rules, right? It's, they're not contingent on any particular goal you have. Everyone has to not murder. Everyone has to not. So, again, it, the idea will be that moral rules follow from the basic laws of logic or laws of reason, right? Now, with the hypothetical imperatives, fairly straightforward why this would be the case. So, um, yeah, if I have a certain desire, if I desire to get to Woodbury University, right, at the quickest possible way, then it would be rational to take the five, right? That, that sort of makes sense. Hypothetical imperatives follow rules of reason. If you have a certain desire, right, and you understand the best way to achieve that desire, then you ought to do that. Is it possible that these categorical imperatives, like don't lie, don't steal, period, those be grounded in the laws of logic or the laws of rationality as well, right? Um, even if it doesn't depend on any particular goal. And uh, Kant argues that, yes, this is the case, that these categorical imperatives, in fact, follow from one single categorical imperative, 
and this categorical imperative um, basically establishes the, the rational nature of morality. Let's start with the categorical imperative comes in versions. Kant seems to think that they're equivalent, right? Um, but let's start with part one. The first one says, and we'll explain what these words mean, right? Because it's a little hard to parse the words. Act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should be a universal law. By maxim here, he means rule, right? Um, so it goes something like this. Suppose that you're going to do something, anything. You want to know if it would be morally right to do that. Well, then you, you first ask yourself, what rule or maxim would I be following if I did this thing? Then you ask yourself, would I want everyone to follow that rule all the time, right? Would I will it to be a universal law? If the answer is yes, then it's moral and you should do the thing. If the answer is no, that I would not want everyone to follow this rule all the time, it's immoral and you shouldn't. do. So here's one example, right, of the categorical imperative. Again, it's sort of a the most general rule that will generate all of the moral rules. So suppose you need some money, right? You're uh, short on your rent. You really need just a hundred bucks this month. Right? You ask the phone, hey, could you please lend me a hundred bucks? But you also know you're not going to be able to pay it back. So behind, right? That by the time you paid your rent and you make your next hundred bucks, you're going to be you're going to owe it for next month's rent. And um, you just, but you also know that if you told the truth. They wouldn't give you 100 bucks, right? The question is, should you make a promise to your friend to pay them back, right, so that you can get the 100 bucks, even though you know you won't get it? Well, according to the categorical, the categorical imperative, there's two steps. First, ask yourself, what maxim would I be following if I did this, right, if I um, made a false promise to my friend? Um, would the rule be something like, it's okay to make a promise you know you won't keep if Know it benefits you in some way or something like that. Um, okay, so that's the rule, right? You're saying, oh, it's okay to break promises, you know, if it'll if, if it'll help you out. And now you ask yourself, okay, would I want that? Would I want that maxim to be a universal law that everyone followed all the time? Um, or more properly, could I will that? Could I make that a universal law? Would it even be possible for that to be a universal law? Um, well, let's imagine what the world would be like if everyone always made promises that they knew they wouldn't keep. What would happen to the practice of promising, right? Would anyone believe anyone's promise? Probably not, right? Um, and if no one believed anyone's promise, would anybody lend you money, right? Would anybody take your promises seriously? Would there even be any point in promising? And would people just pretty much stop making promises? Right? No one believes them, no one keeps them. The point of even having this practice of promising. Um, the whole practice of promising would just sort of collapse into incoherence or pointlessness, right? And to Kant, that's a sort of irrationality or incoherence right, that is packed into the idea of making it uni a universal practice to break promises. You can't even really conceive of a world where there's where everybody breaks promises all the time because there wouldn't be promises anymore, right? Because what would be the point? So he thinks breaking promises is immoral because it's irrational because you can't make it universal, right? It becomes incoherent if you make it universal. So in that way, acting immorally is acting irrationally, right? It's acting in a way that can't be universalized. Let's try another example, see if we've got this right. So uh, what about lying, right? So suppose I'm thinking about lying about something, right? Um, I don't know, you are, uh, right, you, you, you're putting in an assignment late and you're thinking about sending me an email, lying and saying that's, you know, um, whatever you really um, Okay, so you ask yourself, hmm, is it moral for me to do this? Is it moral to lie to my professor? First step, right? Now, there's two steps to running this through the categorical imperative. First, I ask, well, what maxim would I be following, right? What rule would I be following 
and it would be something like, it's okay to lie if you can get something out of it. And then the second step is you ask yourself, okay, could everyone follow that rule all the time? Um, well, imagine a world where everyone just lies all the time whenever they feel like it. Uh, would anyone believe anything anyone ever said, right? Um, and how can human beings really communicate don't on a base level assume that people are for the most part telling the truth, right? That seems to be a, a prerequisite for communication to exist is that we, most of the time, obviously we know people can lie sometimes, but we think the basic assumption is that when I'm telling you something, I actually believe that thing. But if I universalize the maximum of lie whenever you want, um, it seems like we wouldn't be able to have that assumption that people are telling the truth, and it seems like all communication would break down. And again, communication breaks down, then there's no lying, right? If the whole point and the benefit to lying is people are assuming you're telling the truth, right? But if no one's assuming you're telling the truth, then you can't get anything out of lying. So again, by universalizing, right, this maxim and assuming it's a world where everybody follows it, the whole thing breaks down and there's no point in lying anymore anyways. So again, Hogg thinks this in some way shows that moral behavior is ultimately irrelevant, right? Um, I'm curious what you think, uh, definitely in the discussion, right? Uh, I'd love to hear whether you think this approach to can work, right? Um, it seems plausible for promising and lying. When we get to, uh, next week, we'll read Christine Courtyard, uh, who gets into the details of uh, how exactly, more precisely, do we interestingly tricky, right? Uh, that there's something appealing about it, right? That it makes morality an issue of rationality, but um, it's a little hard to work out. A little preview. Um, what about murder, right? Can you make murder somehow irrational if everyone did it? Um, I don't know, think about it, write about it in the discussion. Okay. Kant then seems to think, at least, you know, for uh, promising, right? Uh, promising is immoral, and you shouldn't, sorry, not promising, breaking promises is immoral, right? And you shouldn't break promises because, again, you can't universalize it without incoherence. Lying is immoral, again, because you can't universalize it without incoherence. And period, right? That means don't break promises and don't lie, ever, right? So, if you think about it, that's sort of extreme, right? So imagine, uh, you know, you're in Nazi Germany, right? Now, Kant was long before World War II, right? A couple hundred years. Um, but imagine you're in Nazi Germany and, you know, you're hiding a Jewish friend in your home. The uh, stormtroopers, the SS, came to your door, knock on the door, do you have any Jews in your house? What do you do? Do you lie, right? Do you say, nope, no Jews here? Well, Kant would say, no, you, you need to always tell the truth. You can never lie, right? Um, it's immoral, and, and morality is an unbreakable rule, right? You'd have to, again, the categorical imperative, right? You'd realize that, yeah, I can't universalize lying, um, and so I sh it's immoral, I shouldn't lie. Right? Um, but that might strike you as a little extreme, right? Surely, you know, a little little white lie, as we say, in order to save a life, right? You know, what would the utilitarian say? The utilitarian would say, yes, for God's sake, lie, right? Life is so much more important. Than um, but Kant would say, no, yeah, you can't lie. Um, now, maybe there's a way out for Kant, right? And Elizabeth Anscombe pointed it out, right? Now, Kant himself, if you read his writing, he, he is on the side of, no, you should never lie. He thinks that's what his um, approach to ethics entails. But Anscombe is sort of coming to Kant's aid despite Kant, right? And saying, well, look, Kant, you don't have to be that severe, right? Um, it could still be rational and, and universalizable. It all depends on how you formulate the maxim that you're trying to universalize, right? So lie whenever you want. Sure, yeah, that seems like that would be hard to make it so that everyone followed that. But what about something like lie when it would save an innocent life? Seems like everybody follow that rule, right? There wouldn't be any sort of like 
breakdown in communication or incoherence. You know, it wouldn't come up very often in the first place, right? Um, seems like everyone could do that. So why can't that be the rule you're following? Right? It seems like Kant's approach is very sensitive to how you formulate the maxim that you're trying to universalize, right? So <clears throat> Kant considers this kind of situation, this kind of problem. Of course, it was long before um, World War II, but let's keep the Nazi example, just even though that wouldn't historically be what Kant would have. But he says something like, um, the problem with uh, trying to make exceptions and lie when you think it would save a life, when it had, would have good consequences, is that you never really know what the consequences are going to be, right? So suppose you do lie, right? Maybe the SS officers would leave and everything would be okay, right? But maybe not, right? Maybe they would just storm the house anyways, right? And then maybe they would kill you as well as your friend, or maybe, unbeknownst to you, your friend slipped out the back and you lie and you get the SS officers to leave and then they just catch your friend in the street. Const bigger point is like, you can't know the consequences of your actions, and so you shouldn't be basing morality on consequences. Um, and you know, you could offer a similar objection to Truman's dropping the atom bomb, right? He, he sort of gambled, you know, dropping this bomb on a bunch of civilians, hoping that the Japanese would surrender, but he didn't know that would be the case for sure, right? For all we know, that could strengthen their resolve, and then he would have destroyed it in civilians, an entire city of civilians, and would have had to fight the blink and bottle on top of it, right? Um, so again, I'm curious here to see um, how you would respond to Kant. Is it really true that we can just never know the consequences or do, I mean, clearly we do sometimes, you know, whole lives we we act on what will happen in the future. And, and uh, the reason we're, we're all alive right now is that we're, a lot of the time we're pretty accurate about predicting Future, right, so not right that we can just never know the consequences of our actions, or can we say pretty probable in many cases that you know we could say that lying would save a life and wouldn't cause some horrible other thing to happen? Um, curious to hear what you think. So that's the basic idea of at least Kant's approach to the ontology, grounding morality in rationality by saying that again. Immoral actions, if they're universalized, become contradictory or incoherent. Um, and it's an attractive approach. Uh, and half of philosophers are utilitarians, half of them are uh, Kantians, you know. Um, and I think our brains are split in the middle in that way, too. But there's a number of, you know, serious problems for deontology that there are for utilitarianism. Uh, one problem is if moral rules are unbreakable, right, what would happen if two unbreakable moral rules conflict with each other, right, so that by following one, you break the other and vice versa, right? Um, seems like it's entirely possible that that could happen, right? Um, Elizabeth Anscombe was married to another philosopher, Peter Geach. Uh, Peter Geach argued that um, even though it's possible in principle, he thinks God would never ever let such a situation happen. So um, because God wants to make sure that everything is, you know, perfectly rational, he would just, I don't know, intervene or design the universe so that you would never be put in a situation where like, whatever, don't lie and don't kill would somehow both be demanded. Of, you know, if you, if you lied, then you killed, or sorry, didn't lie, then you ended up killing. And if you didn't kill, you ended up lying or something like that. He thinks God would never put you in that situation. Um, but I mean, historically, it seems like exactly these sorts of things have occurred, right? So, you know, we can just go to our Nazi example. Right? So you could think of that example as a conflict between two arguably more basic moral rules, like one, don't lie. And the other is, you know, don't help people murder innocent people, right? Uh, if you lie to the stormtroopers, you're lying. That's bad. But if you tell them the truth, then you're helping them murder somebody. And that seems like it could be bad, too, right? And you know, there are documents of this happening in, in World War II, right? There were Dutch fishermen attempting to smuggle Jews out of the country in their boats. And they were 
you know, regularly inspected the Nazis and, you know, they would have to lie to the Nazis or, you know, facilitate the, the murder of innocent people. So it does seem like God allows rules to conflict and it does seem to be a serious problem for Dion when you not break um, an unbreakable rule when they So, you know, I don't know, maybe, you know, again, there's always the option to reformulate the maxim, as Elizabeth Anscombe pointed out, and um, if you go that way with it, then maybe you can sort of meet a lot of these apparent contradictions by reformulating the maxims involved, you know. Um, and in general, there, there is a deep appeal to deontology, which is, we've already said sort of over and over throughout the course that um, morality should be reasons-based. Um, I can't go around telling people you shouldn't have an abortion or you should have an abortion uh, and refuse to answer the why, right? Any sort of ethical claim or moral claim I make, any moral judgment I may make, I make on you, um, if you say, well, what are the reasons for your judgment? I, I owe you reasons. That's how morality works. Um, and Kant makes that the reason that we owe reasons for our moral judgments is that Moral judgments are rational judgments, right? Morality just is rationality, right? Um, this is the, and it also connects with the universe, universalization, right? Again, the categorical imperative says, um, okay, here's the rule I'm following. Can I make it universal? This is the nature of rational rules of reason, rules of logic, right? When you ask me, again, if I say, have an abortion, or don't have an abortion, or you should or shouldn't do this, um, and you ask me why, the reasons I give you should be reasons that would appeal to anybody. The point of reasons is that it would to convince the human, right, that would uh, would hear those reasons, right? And this is also the way logic works, right? Um, the axioms of logic and of mathematics are true always for everybody, right? And so what Kant is really saying here is you can't pick and choose your morality based on what's convenient or what gives you a certain outcome. Um, morality has to be grounded in our nature as rational, right? Um, it can go, right? It has to be universal and, and therefore to be universal is to be rational. Um, but does that mean that the rules can never have exceptions? Or does that take it a little bit too far? Again, to be rational, to be reasons responsive, really only means that if there's an exception to the rule, there should be a good reason for that exception, one that everyone would accept. And it seems like lying to prevent the murder of an innocent person, perfectly reasonable exception to don't lie. Um, everyone would accept, yeah, that's a good exception. And, and again, it, it seems like, as long as it's universalizable, that's not a problem for Kant. Even though Kant, the historical figure, said, no, no, don't lie, doesn't have exception. You know, it seems like you can really, and again, so there's there's Kant the person, and you can be a Kantian that broadly agrees with his arguments, but sort of place in the historical Kant, and sort of what Anscombe does when she says, look, we can really, you know, we can work with these maxims, and maybe the relevant maxim here is don't lie unless you get sick. Wouldn't everyone agree to that? Seems universalizable, right? Doesn't seem to be a problem. Oracle Kant. So remember I said there were different versions of the categorical imperative. So, so far I've just been talking about the first one, right? That deals with for any given action, what maxim are you following? Could that maxim be universalized? There's another approach, another version of the categorical imperative that's based in um, special status of human being. So Kant placed a very high value on humanity. But each person was irreplaceable. So, you know, if my computer dies, right, um, I can go buy another computer, I can buy the exact model, I can buy an even nicer one, right? And, um, you know, if so long, you know, if someone else paid for it, no skin off my back, right? It wouldn't bother me at all. Um, child dies, totally different story. This is a tragedy that can't be remedied, right? You can go have another baby, right? But it's a 
different child, right? It's not a replacement of, um, and he doesn't think any other objects, according to Kant, at least, even there aren't even, even any animals that have this sort of special value that makes them irreplaceable, right? Why? What is, why are humans so special? Um, a couple reasons, according to Kant. First of all, people have, um, right? So when I want something, that thing that I want, be it a candy bar or right, love or a new iPhone, that thing now has value for me, right? Um, I have just created value. My desire brings value into the world. Right? Without humans who are running around wanting things, nothing has any particular value. It's just objects spinning around right in space. You have humans and their desires for certain things and not for other things. Now we have a, we have brought value into the world. Um, morality is a, sort of a, a value laden discipline, right? It says certain types of actions have a, you know, are good. Certain other option actions are bad, right? Good and bad are value. That's right. Basic desires for things introduce values into the world and value is the foundation of morals. Another point, right, that Kant thinks makes humans special is we have free will. So um, we can make rationality, right, and we can make choices. We can decide, you know, we can have our desires for what we want. And we can make choices to get those things, right? Um, and he thinks our ability to make choices, our ability to will, right, to do one thing and instead of another, um, is the basis of our morality, right? So. The moral actions are the ones that come from a good will, right? And immoral actions are ones that come from a bad will. What this means is that intentions matter very much for Kant, right? So remember for you utilitarians, intentions didn't matter at all, right? It was only consequences. If I'm trying to help you, right, and I give you five bucks, but then you go and you spend that five bucks on a burger that uh, gives you food poisoning and you die, I did a bad thing according to the utilitarian. Even though I was trying to help you, the consequences were bad, I did a bad thing, right? Kant, the exact opposite. It's all about my will, right? The, my intention and the choice I made. If my giving you the five dollars was emanating from a good will, then it was a good thing. And Kant's version of it really, I think, resonates with us, right? We think that intentions are what matter morally, typically, right? When we read the actual uh Selections from Kant will have much more to say about this will. This is how he sort of frames it from. Um, but anyway, so Kant thinks ultimately that morality only exists because people exist, right? Uh, we introduce the moral dimension into the universe by being free, rational beings, we value things, we make choices. So this leads us to. Um, the other version of the categorical imperative, which again, Kant somehow thinks is equivalent to the first version. Here's the second version. Act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end, never as a means only. So again, he thinks this is basically equivalent to the other version, right? Um, we can run it through the same examples, and at, at the very least, we can see if it gives us the same answers. So um, remember our first example of you need a hundred bucks and you borrow it from your friend promising to pay them back even though you know you can't act, right? Um, so we ask ourselves, okay, are, are we treating this person um, as an end in himself? Let's suppose your friend is a male, right? Um, are we treating our friend as an end in himself or is we treating our friend as a, only a means to our ends, right? Well, in this example, you're using your friend as a means to solve your money problem. What you're not doing is treating him as an end in himself. Right? What would it mean to treat him as an end in himself? That would be to treat him how he wants to be treated, right? To let him make rational decisions on his own by giving him all the information, not by tricking him, right? Um, treat your friend as an end in himself would be to say, look, I really need a hundred bucks very badly. I don't know if I can pay you back. I probably can't, right? Would you still give me the hundred bucks? That would be treating that person as an end in himself. Whereas when you leave someone, you're treating
treating them merely as a means to your own ends. Um, you, doing that, you violate the second verb. Um, so again, you know, maybe you tell your friend the truth and he decides to give you the money. Now, we treat people as a means all the time, right? Even in that version, you have treated him as a means to solve your money problem, but you haven't treated him merely as a means, right? You've also treated him as an end in himself by treating him as a rational being who can make choices, right, without being deceived. So it's not a problem per se to treat people as means to our ends. We do that all the time with social features, right? You know, if I want to go get a burrito at Chipotle, um, you know, yeah, by giving the ordering the burrito and giving them the money, I'm treating them as a means to my end of getting a burrito, right? But they voluntarily gone, you know, entered into this agreement. Hey, I'm going to work burritos for people in exchange for money. You know, they they rationally chose that deal, right? You know, in a sense, you're using me as a means to get your degree, but you know, as a, I chose this job, right? In addition to treating me as a means, you're also treating me as an end to myself. So as long as somebody has, you know, freedom of choice to use their rational faculties, then you're not treating them only as a means. But if you use force, deception, or coercion, now you're taking away their free choice, um, deceiving them about uh, what choices they have, right? And this is actually true of yourself as well, right? So Kant thinks that you can yourself only as a means and fail to treat yourself as fully human. Addiction or bad habits, you know, laziness, drug addiction, whatever. Um, you're not treating yourself. Also, uh, suicide is morally wrong. You're not in some way, you are not uh, um, the value you have as, as a human being. Now, interestingly, um, Kant ends up a little bit uh, sort of libertarian in some ways, right? So he thinks that paternalistic laws are wrong. So drug laws that restrict what a person can do, you know, for themselves without harming anybody, right? So, you know, law that says you can't smoke pot ever, um, Kant was saying that's treating people as a means to your end of like having a drug-free society, right? But he thinks it would be up to each person and, and Maybe it should be wrong for them to do drugs, but you can prevent them from doing it if they're not harming anybody, right? Um, heat belt laws, like helmet laws, things like that. If you're only harming yourself, he doesn't think that um, you should be coerced, right, into acting. In, in, in what... And this also has interesting um, consequences for his view about punishment, right? The utilitarian approach and the Kantian or deontological approach uh, have very different uh, approaches to criminal. So um, Jeremy Bentham argued this explicitly, and anybody who understands utilitarianism would this would make sense. For them, punishment, right? Putting someone in jail is inflicting pain, right? That's bad. It's pain is bad. Period. Right. So. Sentencing someone to jail, for, even for murder, in itself, the jail term has no value, right? It's got a negative value. It was in the pain column, right? So the only reason you would ever sentence someone to jail, even for murder, would be if the pleasurable effects outweighed the pain involved. So utilitarians, when they justify, you know, jail sentences, it's something like, well, the consequences in the long term will be good. You know, we've taken this murderer off the street, so we can't cause any more pain. Um, and also we'll try to rehabilitate him so that if we let him out eventually, um, creating more pleasure and less pain. And for the utilitarian, it's always forward looking. Whatever murders the person committed in the past, um, that's in the past. We can only think about the future, decide how to treat them. And, you know, some people truly believe that, right? But it's a little bit at odds that our sort of instinctive and traditional view about justice is sometimes execution, right? Sometimes we think that part of the point of punishment is to make the wrongdoer suffer because they've made someone else suffer, right? an eye for an eye. So people that are in favor of capital punishment, it's retributive, right? Um, capital punishment doesn't accomplish anything that, you know, life in prison wouldn't accomplish as far as consequences. 
what it accomplishes is retribution, right? Again, you know, for, um, right, for the utilitarian, you know, lots of kinds of punishment can be justified as for their future um, effect, right? And, and in fact, involve the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, right? That's, that's the sort of a utilitarian approach. Well, the point of jail is not to punish so much to punish someone for the bad stuff they did, but to fix them so they can get out of society and they'll go do good things and, and things of that sort. Right? Um, and, you know, maybe that's true, right, from a utilitarian perspective, but Kant has a interesting perspective on it as well that I find sometimes more and more convincing every time I read it. Right, so Kant doesn't like this sort of corrections, rehabilitation approach to punishment, right? Um, and he thinks it's just, it's violating the second version of the categorical imperative. You're treating the criminal as a means to some end, right? You're treating the criminal as um, somehow to sort of tool, right? To be rehabilitated, to then go out in the society and, and produce pleasure, right? Um, we're trying to change the prisoner to suit us rather than giving the prisoner a choice to do the right thing. Um, thinks that straightforward retribution is the right approach, right? Whatever from the victim should be taken from the criminal up, up to and including life, right? Um, he thinks that that's the only way that you can treat, right, the criminal as an end in him or herself. Why? Because we're treating that criminal as a rational being, right, that made a choice and faced the consequences, right? We're not treating them like an animal to be trained, right, to be docile in society, right? He says, okay, Mr. Criminal, right? You're grown up, right? You knew, right, the difference between right and wrong. You chose to steal or kill. Um, so we're choosing now to from you what you've taken from us. Right? We're not going to try to coerce you or um, brainwash you into being a good citizen, right? I'm, we're assuming that you were already a rational being and you just made a choice, right? You can kind of view it as sort of the the dark side of the categorical imperative, right? So in choosing to kill, right, I implicitly said, okay, you know, I've got some sort of maxim that I'm operating by saying something like it's okay to murder, or it's okay to take life if you want to. And I implicitly sort of decided that I'm going to universalize that, right? Even if the, even if the um, criminal wasn't, you know, the first version of the categorical imperative, um, Kant says they've committed to something like that, they've committed to a world where, it, um, everybody murders, right? And he says, okay, if that's the world you choose, then that's the world you're going to live in and you're going to get killed. Um, so it's kind of harsh, right? But in another sense, it's treating humans as, right, fully rational, fully grown up beings, right? Instead of treating them like children or animals, right? Be manipulated um, into behaving right. He's saying, okay, you no, know, you know how to behave, right? And you chose Here's the consequence. It's interesting, an interesting approach, whether or not you, you know, believe it, at least he's he's given us sort of a, a logical, rational basis for that part of our brain that really does um, survey people. There really is, a lot of people do think that there's the elements of justice. So um, I've gone on uh, sort of long enough. This didn't end up quite as long as I, as I thought. We're definitely under an hour, but um, this will probably be the only uh, lecture week because it is uh, important material and I want you to watch it slowly, watch it twice maybe, right? Read the the two chapters carefully um, and we will next week get into uh, some act the actual writing by Kant and then an article by Korsgaard where she tries to sort of analyze and uh, make sense of the passage. I understand it can be difficult reading, but uh, uh, do take the time.